Now it's turned on. All right. If any of you would like uh, my website, it's tscm.com. My email address is up there. I have business cards if anybody's interested. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. I have a profile. And as a rule, I accept anybody who invites. We're going to be looking at uh, any threat or risk, period, to your privacy movements or behaviors in your vehicles. This will include tracking devices, which are by far the most uh, biggest threat that everybody has. Uh, and people are not aware of it, and a few of you may have heart palpitations here in a few minutes. Uh, and we're also going to talk about video devices. They're not very common anymore. They used to be, but with the advent of high-resolution tracking devices, the video device really isn't that needed. Uh, we're also going to talk about audio devices, telemetry devices, exploitable hardware that came with your vehicle that you probably don't know about, and uh, we're going to talk about how not that you guys would ever do this to someone, how probably what you could call a zero-day exploit on trackers that uh, really hasn't been publicized. We're also going to talk about other hazards and risks that you need to keep an eye on. Before you can do anything at all in life, you have to make a plan. That includes dealing with looking for bugging devices, tracking devices, eavesdropping devices. You have to make a plan. You need to follow your plan. The eavesdropper is expecting you to get distracted. He's going to throw things at you to distract you. Show, show your work. The same way that when you were in high school and college, the teacher said, yes, you have the answer. Show me how you got there. If you can't show yourself how you got there and show other people how you got there, you're probably suffering from schizophrenia and your bug car's not really bugged. So you have to show your work. That's very important. Try to work from shop manuals. These are not owner's manuals. These are shop manuals that local shop, your dealership uses. They're usually about that big for even a small car. Uh, for a motorcycle, they're about that big. There are some essential tools and test equipment that I'll be discussing. You need a place to work. That place can be a 2,000 square foot garage. That place can be a parking spot at a mall, at a hotel. Any place that you can get out of the weather, uh, and on nice days, you can actually do these out in a parking lot at a hotel somewhere. And you have to be knowledgeable of the threats. In the next 30 minutes, you're going to be very knowledgeable about the threats. Uh, with your shop manuals, avoid what are called Chilton-style manuals or multi-year books. You want the, the book for your make, your model, your year, your trim, your powertrain variation. So if you've got a Porsche and it's got this size of an engine in it, don't get a book for this size of an engine. So make sure you have the correct one. Make sure you have electrical diagrams. If you don't have electrical diagrams, it's like driving around Boston without a road map. Okay? It will be an educational experience and probably a very frustrating one, too. Uh, and I have to iterate. These, ma these manuals are expensive, but if you own a $40,000 car, buy a $300 manual for it. These are not the owner's manuals. Uh, you're going to need flashlights, and you're going to see why here in a few minutes. You're going to need lots of extra batteries. Cords and cables and large lights just don't work underneath vehicles. You end up burning yourself. You end up catching things on fire. It's better to use batteries. Uh, you can get battery flashlights up underneath the dash really well. If you have your own shop, then by all means, you can have all kinds of lights and stuff, but most people don't have shops. You're going to need what are called nitro gloves. Not latex, nitrile. These, uh, they're more resistant to grease and oil and grime. You need to get them as thin as possible so you don't get crap on your hands. Uh, technical name. Uh, you need some kind of a protective tarp to park the vehicle on. You also need a ground tarp to go on top of your main tarp so that you can slither around on it. And warm weather is nice. It's really optional. I've done these sweeps when it's 20 degrees out. Froze to death out in the middle you know, of New Hampshire because the client couldn't bring your vehicle to us, and they didn't have a garage, so that's what you make the big bucks for. Uh, the critical test equipment that you need, we'll discuss this. A broadband signal detector is one of the most valuable things you can have. They cost all of $60. You can get them. The best ones I found are made by Wynn Radio in Australia. They're like 60 bucks. You bring it anywhere near wireless transmitters, like this one I'm wearing that is not working.
Okay, if you have a cell phone and the cell phone's on and I bring this at your cell phone, it will talk to me. If you have a GPS tracker on you, this will talk to me. You have to be within inches or it's not going to work. And the inches part is very important. If you have this or you have uh, other products, which we'll talk about later, you can get one for each band of the cell phone uplink frequencies, add a filter to it so it's only looking at that frequency, a tuned antenna, and most cell phone uh, usage in the United States, you're gonna find four uplink frequencies. So you just listen to those four uplink frequencies, dedicate one unit like this or one of the large units to each of those frequencies, and if that cell phone pings once in a day, you're gonna catch it. So even really, really covert devices, they're gonna ping once a day, once every hour. There's one device I'm gonna talk about, it's, it's an extraordinarily covert device. The factory has threatened me with restraining orders for mentioning it, I don't care. Uh, we're gonna discuss, it checks in once an hour. And if you know the devices check in once an hour and you listen in the area for two hours and you don't hear it, it's not on the air, it doesn't exist. Yes? This, 75 bucks, 50 bucks, 25 bucks for shipping. I usually get them a dozen at a time, give them away to clients with my business card stuck on the back. Uh, you're also gonna need some amplifiers, some antennas. These are things you're gonna find in any electronics lab. You're gonna need several spectrum analyzers. Uh, initially, just one. You can get a used, cheap one for about two grand. Uh, if you wanna get fancy, uh, I'll be happy to fix you up with some $100,000 spectrum analyzers that will, you know, I can you know, use it to tell you what Obama's cell phone number is, one of those kind of things. Uh, it needs some digital voltmeter, what are called PCM tools, these are powertrain control module interfaces, we'll go over those in a minute. They let you talk to the computer that's in the vehicle. Very often, talking to the computer in the vehicle will tell you there is a bug in the vehicle because the bug causes misfires to the electrical system misfires to the fuel injectors and throws electrical errors into the electrical system of the vehicle. So somebody throws a bumper beeper on you know, my brand new BMW and I'm getting three or four errors thrown into the PCM controller every single day. I log in and I go, what the hell? I got 400 errors thrown in as misfires but the car is not misfiring. Get out, check it out. Whoa, look at this, there's a 300 milliamp transmitter. Huh. This is interesting, who put that there? You're gonna need a Bluetooth dongle. A lot of these devices interface by Bluetooth. So the spy walks near your vehicle with his PDA, blink, 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 he, he downloads audio, data, video, whatever he wants from your vehicle. Some of these vehicles come with Bluetooth built into them, the owners don't know it. So the service tech can walk up with his PDA, go click, 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 and he downloads all the data from your PCM. He knows where you've been. He has your address book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is, so be careful what you put in your computer, in your car. Uh, you, uh, if you're going to do this hardcore, you gotta get a cell phone service monitor, and this is not for eavesdropping on cell phones. This is, <laughs> this is for capturing header information the companies that make it won't sell you stuff that lets you listen to the payload, but it will let you log header information. You just need to know that a cell phone is active where there shouldn't be one. This box should not have a cell phone in it. If it has a cell phone signal, oops, somebody's played with it. Now in a perfect world, all of these vehicles, all this vehicle work would be done in a 4,500 square foot garage with hydraulic lifts, four mechanics, every known mechanic tools named Earth. It would be a sterile room, epoxy floors, I could wear a lab coat. That would be nice. Uh, usually this is in a hotel parking lot somewhere or out in the middle of Cambridge in the middle of a rainstorm for four hours and be soaked to the bone. Okay, hey, it's, it's a glorious life. Uh, these are some examples of PCM scanners. There's some generic ones you can get for 100 bucks. Uh, you could go to uh, your local auto parts store, even Walmart. You can buy these. An expensive one's gonna run you, yeah, 300 bucks. A really nice one, like the Snap-on Modus, is gonna start about $8,500. But the more expensive it is, the more deeply it lets you probe into the computers of your cars. And a lot of people 
have absolutely no idea that their computer, their car computer runs on Linux. And they are astonished when they start to play around with their stereo system and a penguin comes up. <laughs> okay? <laughs> they, so you can, have a, you can really go wild with this stuff. And when you start probing the computers in your vehicle, there's computers that run the navigation, there's computers that run the airbags, it's a different computer that runs the HVAC, it's a different computer for navigation. You may have 15 computers in one German car. The Japanese, yes? So the no, in the United States, CM buses are OBD2 and OBD3. It's mandated by federal law. If it comes in this country after a certain date, it has to have a universal interface. Now, there is proto there's data, there's, there's data that the federal law mandates must be accessible to anybody. There's a whole bunch of, like Ford, if you take, take a, uh, you know, like a, a, a Crown Vic, and you plug into a Crown Vic, you're going to get everything you see up on the top screen with a generic interface. If you plug in with the Ford interface, you're going to get about 800 times more information. You're going to fill this wall with every time the car has gone over 55 miles an hour, every time the car was driven above 15 miles an hour and all the seat belts weren't done up. Okay? So if you have access to the proprietary, it's like with the Modis and the, the other pro, uh, uh, systems, they allow you to get into the proprietary to like Mercedes, or Chrysler, and you, you can, whatever you have, that's what you need to go get. eBay is a wonderful place for this stuff. Yes? So you were just saying in the United States, do you have knowledge about what people like outside the United States? It, it's catch and catch can. It's, in Japan, they have one standard. In Europe, most of Europe has a modified version of the OBD2 interface, but a lot of it's Bluetooth. And it's hilarious going in Berlin and going by people's car and giving them tune-ups. When they're driving, <laughs> you want to shut somebody's car down in Germany? Bluetooth. Shut their car down like that. Uh, the common vehicle exploits your cell phone is the most exploitable thing in your car. People completely are oblivious to this. They have cell phone, cell phone. Everybody in here probably has at least one cell phone. Some people probably have two or three. Uh, those things are the biggest compromise of your security. Uh, it would be like leaving an, an untended laptop in the middle of this room during a conference for three days. Okay? Uh, the, the next thing that will kill you are your concierge services. And those are classified as like OnStar. And those of you who drive GM are going to be very unhappy here shortly. Ford, Toyota, Porsche, Mercedes, they all have their concierge services. These things are le lethal to privacy and most of them allow a remote listen in. So if you have a GM car and I have your VIN number, I can listen in to you talking to yourself as you drive to work and you'll be oblivious to it. <laughs> now, most of these systems have a 12-bit security code. Most of your very expensive $80,000 cars have a very expensive security system that has a 12-bit security code, which 12 bits of security gives us 4,096 combinations, which takes me approximately three and a half seconds to war dial. Now, your garage door opener, a lot of people have electronic garage door openers. They've got $300 locks on the doors of their house, and they got a $19 Sears garage door opener. Beautiful. Press button. Grab your eight bits of your uh, access code, your garage door opener, go to your house when you're not there, open your garage door, go inside, steal your tools, go inside, bug your car. You probably don't have an alarm system in your garage. Most people don't because they can't roll their garage door open, roll the car in, close the garage door, go in house and turn the alarm off. It, those of you who do have garages, I do recommend that you have an alarm sensor in the garage that has like a one minute timer on it that's a different timer than the delays that you have elsewhere in the house. Protect where you put the car at night. If you have, those of you who have speed passes, shame on you. Okay? 
buy some foil pouches or a mu metal box so you, so you can take the speed pass down, slide it in the mu metal box, it makes it invisible. If you have a speed pass or a RFID passport or a credit card with RFID in it, I own your ass. Okay? Put it bluntly. Uh, so for me to uh, bug your car, I need less than 30 seconds. I don't even need the keys, especially if you have OnStar or you have a Porsche or you have a GM or you have any of the major cars. The more expensive the car is, the easier it is for a spy to get into it. Once a spy is into it, he needs 30 seconds tops. If you have exploitable hardware, like an OnStar, you need less than five seconds. Okay? Now, if you've got like a Ford 150 pickup truck, meh, 45 seconds to a minute. It's rare for it to take more than a minute to break in, put the bug, and be gone. Now, that's a real quick throwdown bug. That's not a high-end device. A high-end device, like something that's deeply hidden, like the FBI is going to hide something really deep and throw it under the dash and spend three, they may come back three or four times to do that. They may come back three times to put the wiring in, and then once the wiring's all set and they're all happy and everything's all duct taped and hidden and concealed and you know it doesn't look like anything, then they'll come back and put the tracker in. So the faster you do it, the easier it is to find. A professional's gonna take his time, but a professional can throw it down real quick. Uh, the, because of the way that the industry has changed, it used to be you had to get a lot of grease on your clothes to find the tracking device because they were hidden. They only worked when the vehicle was in session uh, there was, or in, in movement. There was a company in Florida that made an interesting device that it would only wake up and transmit when the little BB that was inside the little microphone rolled around the microphone because the vehicle was moving and an amplifier picked up the sound of that BB rolling around and activated the tracking device. So if you rocked the car, it would start, the beeper would start going off. Of course, they're talking a beeper that's that big. That, you know, I have pictures of it too, I'll show you. We have to, we refer to it as tickle the sleeping dragon. We want to do things to that tra tracker to make it wake up and start talking to us. In some cases, we just take the vehicle and drive it a couple of blocks or let it warm up for five minutes and the thing starts talking to us. In other cases, if the spy has thrown a lot of money at this or thrown a lot of consideration at this, that dragon doesn't wake up and talk to somebody unless they walk up with a Bluetooth or a Zigbee to do a download or they command it remotely to send its knowledge. So it may only transmit once a week, but it's constantly listening and we can fool it into talking to us. And I'm going to show an exploit how to make one talk to you, which is going to really piss off the manufacturer. Uh, we want it to make up, wake up, we want it to make noise, we want to look for activity on the PCM. Uh, the PCM is your, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, it's the computer that runs your, your engine, your transmission, your systems of your, of your vehicle. Also your radio draws a lot of power because it's the one thing in the vehicle that you don't want to lose a memory on. You don't want to lose your memory in your, in your uh, radio because you're going to lose all your radio channels. You're going to lose your XM. You're going to not remember the track that you were on. So the PCM draws a lot of power. The radio draws a lot of power. If you have a low jack or you have an alarm system, those all draw a lot of power. It's, it's no problem at all for those things, four or five things combined, when your car is turned off, not moving, and hasn't moved in days, for you to be drawn down 250 milliamps. Now, if you have an 1100 amp battery in your car, this is not an issue. It's going to take three years for you not starting your car to kill that battery. In our business, we have to be able to detect a three milliamp draw. So we have to be able to clamp onto a wire, go there should not be any current flowing through this wire. Ooh, I have eight milliamps. Hmm. And I have some current charts I'm going to show you in just a minute. Uh, the easiest detection modality is a physical inspection where you dismantle as needed, but it's always limited by time. It is extraordinarily time consuming. However, if you don't have $200,000 worth of spectrum analyzers and stuff, and you do have a $3 flashlight, you can find a lot of bugs with a $3 flashlight. 
uh, bugs have actually been found laying at the side of the road when the magnet fell off. Okay? People have hit bumps, lost something from their car, heard it banging, got out, looked underneath, didn't recognize what the box was, pulled it loose, took it to the mechanic. The mechanic said, I had no idea what this is. They took it to the police. They went, oh, it's our tracking device. <laughs> There's a technique referred to as a nonlinear junction ping. What we do in that case is we know a frequency that the system operates on, like if it's a GPS tracker, it's going to be listening for the GPS satellite constellation. If it uses a cell phone, because not all of these things use cell phones to talk. Some of them use other mechanisms. What we do is we transmit a broadband noise signal into the band we know it's listening to, and we snap it in, we cut our signal off, and then we look at the second and third harmonics. Because as I ping a signal out, if I throw a business card to you, and you catch it, and you throw it back to me, and the speed is a known factor, which it is, because you know, it's uh, electrons traveling through air, we know, you know just below the speed of light, we can determine the distance. So I can throw a ping out, go, aha, we have something 45 feet away from me, and we have something 37 feet away from me. So this executive's car is bugged, and this executive's car is bugged. No power is applied to the bugs. The bugs only are active. Power is not applied to the bugs at all. What you're doing is you're, illum you're illuminating the front end of the transmitters and the receivers, and then you're cutting off the air, and you're looking for a, essentially a radar return at a harmonic of where you sent it to. Uh, oh, it works beautifully. If this is a cell phone-based device and you transmit a cell phone-based signal to it, uh, you're talking 120 feet detection range easily. I mean, if I had an island with me, I could tell you exactly who in here has a phone and what band it's operating on. No problem. And I could tell you if you had Bluetooth or not on it. Uh, now, manual vehicle inspections involve a lot of crawling around underneath vehicles. It's very messy. It's a less than optimal situation, but you just need flashlights and hand tools and pretty much go anywhere in the world and find bugs. The less developed parts of the world are going to be relying on old school bumper beepers, which you're going to see a lot of pictures of here in a few minutes. The more developed parts of the world, like United States, Europe, Germany, uh, Singapore, you're going to see GPS-based trackers that interface cell phones. Tracking is most often in the United States and some parts of Canada, but not in the rural parts of Canada. The more developed parts of Mexico, but not in the rural parts of, Can of, of Mexico, they have good cell phone coverage in the United States, but they don't have, and they have good GPS all over the world. But to use a GPS cell phone system, you have to have cell phone coverage. No cell phone coverage, you have to revert to old school 70s technology. So, in you, in this area, we're going to find GPS trackers that have cell phones or GPS trackers that are just recorders. It could be an OnStar system, it could be a LoJack system, which are a load of fun, uh, or it could be a security system element, and a lot of the security systems you have in your vehicles can be used to eavesdrop on you. A lot of people are not aware of that, and it, they're very upset when they find out. There's a company called Cyref, S-I-R-F, for those of you who are technically interested go to their website and look at the nice things they can put on something the size of your thumbnail. You'll probably have difficulty sleeping this evening when you realize how small this stuff really is. This is an OnStar surveillance module. It is in all GM vehicles, all Lexuses. This is the exact module that they have. It is a very simple module. It gives us GPS tracking, gives us all vehicle telemetry, tells me when you had your last oil change done. If you have this in your vehicle, I can ATDT, because it uses the Hayes command set, <laughs> at, at 9600 baud. <laughs> so uh, those of you who were around in the 80s know what the ATDT means, and I'm going to give you some of the exploits for that. Uh, it uses a Qualcomm CDMA modem. Uh, this is actually a product made by AnyData for GM. GM puts it in everything that they've made made in the last few years. It gives you full engine control. It gives you full telemetry access so I can see who has their seat belts done up or not. And it gives audio surveillance that may or may not be known to the user of the vehicle. Uh, G OnStar has been given subpoenas by law enforcement agencies. They were illegal subpoenas, but nonetheless, 
requiring them to provide an open audio path into a vehicle as part of a criminal investigation. The, the court quashed the subpoena because OnStar said, oh, well, that's a trade secret. We don't want people knowing that that can be done. Well, guess what? This is one taken apart. We refer to this as a hybrid device because it doesn't give you just one thing. It gives you basically the keys to the kingdom of the entire car. It lets me start the car, roll the windows down, lock the car, unlock the car, turn your headlights on, turn your headlights off, see how fast you're going, what seat are you in, how much do you weigh, okay? The only thing it doesn't do is tell me how much alcohol you've been drinking. This unit is 1.7 inches high by 1.57 inches long. If you go to a junkyard with a screwdriver, you can get about 50 of these in one afternoon. That's what they look like taken apart. This is what it looks like on a spectrum analyzer. This is one of the benefits of having a spectrum analyzer. If one of these things is in your vehicle, at least once an hour, it's checking in through your cell phone system in your area to say, hello, here I am. If I need to make an emergency call, the only way to make the, and I'm going to show you how to make these things behave themselves, is referred to as wire cutters. I'll show you where to cut. <laughs> This is where they're hidden in this particular vehicle. You see that little module? That is the problem child. If you look at the right-hand corner, there's a TNC connector or a barrel connector. You can actually unscrew that, and now it can't talk to anything. You can unplug the cable that comes in to the left side. All of a sudden, it can't talk to anything. Now, the downside is if you have an emergency and you hit that OnStar button, all you're going to be doing is building up the muscles of your finger. You're not actually going to be calling for help. So if you're in a position where you might need to call for help, don't disconnect this. If you don't want Big Brother snooping on what you're doing, disconnect this. Cut the wire, unscrew it. Most of the folks here are technical guys. You get a screwdriver and a hex nut. You just unscrew that bad boy, take it out, and get rid of it. No one will ever know it's missing usually in the back of the car, because they want this to survive an accident, so they generally put it in back. Usually it's around or behind the rear axle on the inside of the car, and they'll usually piggyback it with like an airbag controller. Uh, be careful when you cut this. There may be a heavy gauge orange wire near it. Don't cut that, because you may set your airbags off. <laughs> Trust me. You don't want to do that. Now, for those of you who drive European cars, yes? Does it throw a code if you, uh, if you disconnect it? No. Not if you, if you disconnect it. The way that I disconnect them is I unscrew the connector first. It could be a TNC or a BNC connector. I unscrew that first, very surreptitiously so that nobody knows. Unscrew that first, and then I unplug power. Because if you just unplug power, there's a battery in it, and it'll go, oh, my God, they just unplugged it and battery supervision is one of the functions of this. So you want to undo the antenna first and then pull power. And I've known people who've actually unscrewed it, taken it out, and shorted it out and hit it with a uh, stun gun to burn it out and then put it back in so the mechanic would think they didn't do anything to it. Okay? Now, for those of you who are in Europe and are concerned about European authorities listening to you, here's the European version. This is the version that is installed in European cars that stay in Europe. If they're European cars that come to the United States, they get the OnStar board. It's made by the same company. It's the exact same company. Same engine. In fact, that is a Siemens engine with a Qualcomm control chip. So I'm not saying that Qualcomm's the devil or anything like that, but, you know. Uh, now, video surveillance in a motor vehicle, it's generally less important to know what's going on inside the vehicle. Most people, they're not so concerned with what's going, well, in some cases, what's going on inside the vehicle. They're more interested in what's being said, and they're mostly important to know, or want to know where the vehicle is going or where it's been in the past. So a wife who thinks her husband is philandering it probably isn't concerned about the vehicle being used for the tryst because it's a subcompact or it's a hybrid or a Prius or something. 
But he wants, she wants to know where he's going, what motels is he, where is he getting the lap dances, where is he drinking at. They may be interested to know what's being said, but what's being said, you've got to put a tape recorder in, come back and get the tape recorder. Put the digital a voice recorder in, come back and get it. So people are primarily interested. A smart spy is interested in all of this, but most consumers aren't smart spies. Video is of less value to most spies. So if you find a video camera in your vehicle, you got big problems because somebody's probably trying to make a criminal case on you. Most pri private investigators do not have the technical capability of putting in video. Some can do it. They can all do GPS. A few can do audio. Not many can do video. Uh, I'll give you some examples of uh, cases where video was used. Uh, uh, police chief knew his officers were sleeping. They would find a nice cozy alley somewhere, they'd back up, they'd turn their lights off, turn the radio on, they'd blow up their little air pillow that they use on the airplane, and they'd take a three hour nap. Chief knew what was going on because people were complaining to the department about it. All the police vehicles had dash cams that you look forward, none of the cops used them. The chief spent thousands of dollars for them. So the chief turned the cameras around and he made sure that they were all active. Three officers were suspended because they were sleeping for four plus hours at a time. And uh, <clears throat> I assisted the chief in uh, making sure their cameras worked fine. Uh, and it was just a matter of re-aiming the cameras. Uh, give me a speeding ticket. I don't <laughs> Bastards. Uh, another case was uh, some parents bought a used car for a college age st student. The old owners had bought it for their high school age student and sold it because they didn't need it anymore, the kid wanted a different vehicle. They had installed what's referred to as an integrity video inside the car to videotape everything that the car did. Basically, looking into the car to make sure the kids weren't drinking, smoking dope, or engaging in carnal knowledge in the back seat. Uh, when they sold the vehicle to the next owners, they neglected to remove the system. The kid found it. Kid went ballistic. Not cool. Uh, uh, they blamed their parents. Their parents were going were innocent. The parents went to the other parents. The, they said, oh, yeah, we did that years ago. But it's been in place for four years. It couldn't possibly still work. It did. So this is a case where they wanted to see what was going on, but not necessarily where the vehicle was. In those days, too, GPS was obscenely expensive. And I believe this system actually used a VHS cassette deck hidden in the trunk. So <laughs> we're not talking, you know, extraordinarily high technology. A lot of car rental companies have video surveillance in the car that looks outward. They won't look inward, but they're looking outward to see what kind of dangerous behavior you're engaging in. So if you're going more than 55 miles an hour, yeah, they probably have a GPS tracker in the vehicle. Most rental cars do. A lot of people are very upset to find out that almost everything in the Hertz fleet has GPS trackers in it. So when you get that extra charge for going 85 miles an hour down Route 128, that's how they know. High risk renters, meaning people who are not paying with credit cards, will frequently get a, a vehicle that has a camera in it of some sort. And what it will do is when there's a violation of speed, it will take a picture of where they were so that they can match that or if they run a, uh, if there's an impact, the last 15 seconds prior to impact, it's actually recording to a little SD chip that's built into the vehicle. So that if the vehicle's in an accident, no problem, they go up to it, they pop the chip out, here's what you were doing 15 seconds before the car crashed. And this is different than the black box recorders, because a lot of your vehicles have black box recorders in them, and all commercial vehicles have, like trucks, they all have DOT mandates, they must have black box recorders in them. The transmission has one, and the engine has one, as part of the powertrain control module. Some motorcycles do, which I'm not happy about. Uh, a spouse says, that is not my brand of lipstick. This is a very common situation. Uh, marital infidelity. Oh my God, I know my husband's cheating on me. I know my wife is cheating on me. I want to see what's going on. Uh, the philanderer engaged us to check the vehicle. 
We found evidence the device was there. It was actually a multi-billion dollar uh, divorce settlement. There was a device there. The device was found. It was installed illegally. There was nothing anybody could do about it. This is the size of your GPS trackers. They are no larger than this. If they get bigger than this, they usually have a cell phone built into them. This is a, it records where you are, okay? It records where you are, and then you have to go retrieve the unit and download. Some of them you can retrieve through Bluetooth or Zigbee. Uh, very inexpensive, I think this is like 125 to 160 bucks, 175 bucks max, very inexpensive. There's millions of these things sold every year. This is a slightly larger one. This is a very nice user interface. It will tell you exactly how long somebody was where they were. So you can say, uh, this guy was hanging out at his girlfriend's house for two hours. Uh, you're talking 100 bucks. Easily, easy, easily found electronically. This is the trim track, very common uh, device. This is probably the most sold device out there. Uh, they are a little bit large. Those are AA batteries you see. However, it can be programmed so that those batteries last for many, many, many weeks. You can actually have a battery pack last six weeks on one of those. So some, the spy does not have to get into your car for six weeks if he, hard, if he uses batteries. If he hardwires it, he never has to get in again. The default password for these units is eight zeros in a row. Most spies never change the default password. Most spies also do not change the default unit ID. About 98% of the time, when these things are installed, I can walk up to the vehicle, fire up my cell phone service monitor, go, oh, we have a CDMA in here. Looks like a trim track. Oh, let's access the internal modem. This is the exploit <laughs> that will, the first line gives you access, the second line says, <laughs> wake up the sleeping dragon, and now instead of checking in three times a week, check in every 10 seconds, oh, and crash immediately, so you immediately do a restart. This is the equivalent of a buffer overflow <laughs> on a Windows machine. It's two lines. It's my exploit for the conference. The, it actually makes this scream itself to sleep because it burns through the batteries in a matter of minutes. So now, it, and it max, oh, the next thing is it maxes out the spy's credit card. So whoever, because you have to have a credit card to make one of these bad boys work. So if you get a Sprint account that has a $6,000 credit limit, he now owes Sprint $6,000 because it's checking in with its coordinates 50 cents for every text message or however whatever his system is. Once you get it screaming, they are so easy to find. For one thing, they get hot to the touch. And if it's in upholstery, you just have to go, ha, 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 oh, here it is. I'm burning my hand on it. Uh, <laughs> if you have a spectrum analyzer, or we call these things turds, if you have a turd, you can actually go, oh, here it is. OK? Uh, it, if you want to screw with a spy even more, once you do that, you seize control of it, you plug it into serial port of your computer, and you change the password so that he can't get back into it. Even, so even if you find it and you haven't made it scream, and you physically find it by plugging it in, you can reset the password, but not his SIM card. <laughs> and when that guy starts getting $12,000 bills from Sprint, or Sprint calls and says, you owe us $12,000, your Amex card is maxed out, He's going to want to come get his device back. You've just made him come back out, and you've just burned him. Okay? Usually, it only takes two times to smoke these bad boys out. This is a, let's see if anybody's blood pressure goes up in here on this one. This is an FBI tracking device. They consider it to be classified. Uh, I don't see any classified markings on it. And since it's made in Canada, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> This is made by a company called Orion. This is a post-9-11 tracker. After 9-11, they said, oh, this is classified. You can't talk about that. I said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the classified uh, tracker looks like on a spectrum analyzer. You get within 300 feet of this bad boy, and it's alive. You've just caught it. Now you've got to find it in the vehicle. You know it's there. you just got to find it. And the easiest way to find it is to hook up to the power lines 
for the vehicle and look, because this unit blows 350 milliamps for one and a half seconds, and then it goes to sleep and it only draws one milliamp. So what you do is you go out, you jiggle a car back and forth where you're hooked up to your amp meter, and all of a sudden the battery goes, oh crap, somebody's drawing 300 milliamps. And then you just walk your amp probe, aha, here it is, it's hooked up underneath the vehicle. Oh, it's hooked up underneath the dash. So you just find your power bus, you hook up amp probes to your power bus, so then you just, you know which line it's hooked up to, and then you just iterate to where it is. It might take a couple hours, but you can tease these bad boys into talking to you. Uh, they can be dormant for 15 minutes, so they usually check in every 15 minutes if the vehicle's not in motion, or days. So if you park at Logan and it's set up properly, it won't emit anything for days, which is fine. We go up to the vehicle, we jostle the vehicle, we make the device think that it's being driven somewhere when it's not. Bing! Okay, here it is. And of course, we would, of course, give these back to the FBI if we found one. Uh, microphones are easy to find in your vehicle. Covert microphones are usually in, behind, or near the mirror, the rear view mirror. If they're if you go up to your windshield and you peel your fingers up your windshield, you're going to come across a ridge along the, the, uh, the, the window. If you peel that back slightly, not much, but just ever so slightly, there's a piece of trim. The microphones are frequently in, hidden behind that piece of plastic trim. Sometimes they'll be hidden in the A pillars, but if they're hidden in the A pillars, they tend to pick up too much noise and you only get one side of the conversation. Smart Spy will put them in both sides. A really smart spy will take your dome light out He'll put the microphone up in the dome light forward slightly so it's firing down into the vehicle, right, so it catches everybody in the vehicle. Then you put your dome light back up. So we're not talking test equipment. We're talking flashlights to find these things. A little handheld cosmetic mirror works beautifully. Cost you a buck and a half for the flashlight, 50 cents for the mirror at Walmart. Uh, a really good spy will actually put everything in the carpet. So he'll actually take up the, the strips, the rocker strips, He'll pull those up. He'll give him access to the carpet. He can put all these electronics in the carpet, under the carpet, near the carpet, put the carpet back down, and you'll search that car until the end of time, and nobody ever thinks to look under the carpet. Or he'll pull the, uh, the uh, drain cocks out of your vehicle, which are the little rubber uh, body uh, plugs. He'll pull those out from underneath the vehicle and replace it with one that has a transmitter built into it. Any speaker can be used as a microphone. If your car suddenly develops a dead speaker, you need to find out why. Because somebody may be using that speaker as a microphone. Okay? Be very suspicious of dead speakers. And if you find a dead speaker, you better check the wires as carefully as possible, usually because they'll put these in the back speakers, not in the front speakers. Because people tend, to, if you fool with the speakers in the front of the car, it's very detectable. If you knock out one of the speakers in back, it's probably not, most people are not going to pick up on that. So if you knock out a speaker, if somebody's doing a bugging and they knock out a speaker, watch it. You need to find out why that speaker doesn't work. If you hook up a voltmeter to it and you're getting voltage that says you've got audio coming down the line and then you hook up an ohm meter to the speaker and the speaker says zero ohms, you probably just burned it out and just put a new spe speaker in it should work. But you've got to follow those speaker wires closely. Audio recorders are a real hoot. They're real easy to find. Most of them use what's called a PIC controller chip, and, and it uses a 32 kilohertz oscillator. So all you do is use, use a little ferrite uh, coil. You tune that bad boy to, seven, or to uh, 32 kilohertz, sweep the car with it. If there's a wrist watch hidden in the car, you'll find it. You'll also find PIC controllers. You'll find timing devices. You'll find you know, little blinky toys that the kids lost with a $5, little $5 circuit. Uh, your audio risks, old school, your, your risks were below the belt line of the vehicle. The belt line is an imaginary line that's directly under your behind and the top of the seats. That was the belt line of the vehicle. Old school was to put all the electronics below the belt line of the vehicle because they had to be huge. New school, because you're using GPS and cell phone systems, you can put them anywhere on the vehicle, but they need to be able to see the sky, but you can take a GPS transmitter, put it on a magnet, stick it underneath a car, and because of the reflections off the ground, it will still work. It won't be as effective, 
but you can hide a GPS receiver anywhere on a vehicle, except inside a metal box. That's, if you put it in a Faraday cage, it's not going to work too well. Transmitters are very easy to detect. If it transmits, I own it. It's the safest, easy for a lazy spy, and the lazy spy is easy to catch. This is another device that I'm not supposed to be talking about. This is a vehicle audio bug. It's, uh, okay, it's just the way I'm looking at it. Uh, this is a vehicle audio bug. Uh, the switches on it are just there for testing. They're not part of the device. The silver box is the actual device. That's about the size of a pack of cigarettes, and those are BNC connectors. This is a cell phone remote access. So this device stores audio. The spy then logs in over a cell, you know, basically over the internet. He logs into the device. He downloads the stored audio when the vehicle is not in use. So you go in, you have a long discussion about, you know, buying Microsoft or something for nothing. Uh, this captures the conversation. The spy can then download it over a cell phone channel. Cell phone is very is a big deal. This is an audio bugging device for a vehicle, slightly different make and manufacture. But if you notice the size markings, you're talking something that's two inches by four inches, and will throw a considerable signal, a considerable distance. Uh, this is actually a live unit. This unit does not store; it just transmit at whatever frequency the crystal set at. Uh, this is a 1.6 gigahertz truck telemetry system. These are on almost all commercial trucks you see on the sem out on the highway. The truck drivers usually don't know they exist. So if a truck driver says, I'm broke down by the side of the road, and they go, uh, no, you're not, it's not because of GPS. It's because they can actually see the RPM of his engine. They can actually see what gear he's in. They can see that his truck really isn't overheated, so all the telemetry of the truck is available through this 1.6 gig up satellite uplink. And this is a GPS downlink and a satellite uplink. So this is actually transmitting up at, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 8 dBm. And for those of you who are electronics people, know that's like 10 milliwatts. It's nothing. It's extraordinarily difficult. This is what the systems look like. This is one with a casing, and this is what's inside the casing. Uh, they're very low power. They work extraordinarily well. Telemetry is bad news for anybody who drives a vehicle commercially, anybody who drives a dump truck, snow plow, uh, because if they get in an accident, the state police, the first thing they're going to do when they find, after they find out what your name is and if you have insurance, is they're going to go to the vehicle, they're going to get the black box or they're going to go to the vehicle and download the PCM because the, the PCM knows that well, how fast you were going, did you have your seat belts on, did you have your lights on, did you have your windshield wipers on, how fast were you going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If it's a commercial vehicle, you could go to jail for a very long time. If it's a civilian vehicle, uh, probably the worst that's going to happen is you're going to get one hell of a ticket and you might go to jail for a little bit of time. This is the 70s and 80s era bumper beepers. The victim's car, we'll call it the victim's car, is the device on the left. It's about the size of, uh, it's about that big. It would usually have one or two antennas on them, and the antennas laid down. So if you took a flashlight and looked under your vehicle, you see these two coat hanger things hanging down with little beads on them. Very easy. You could actually drive behind somebody in Washington, D.C. and go, aha. Okay. And then the spy had to have a receiver that was this big mounted down on the floor with antennas, a cluster of antennas mounted on the roof. And then the item that you see on the top, he'd mount on the dash, and a little needle would tell him if the person was to his left or to his right. And you had to be very skilled to get anything of any value, because if you were in Manhattan, this thing is worthless. If you're out in the middle of West Virginia, yeah, it'll tell you where the guy's got his pot farm growing but it's not going to give you three-foot resolution like GPS does these days. This is an er early 90s era bumper beeper. Note the big magnets. The spy would go up, he would plug that, he would literally attach it with a magnet to the bottom of your vehicle. The B and C connector is for external power until the federal courts said, if you tie it into vehicle power, you must have a search warrant. And so the companies that made these said, this is not going to work because most of these are not being used legally 
no search warrant, so we're, they're just going to, this is a 100 megahertz uh, item. All you need to find is the flashlight. That's it. A pair of coveralls and a flashlight. It's a pretty big device outside the vehicle. This is 2004 era bumper beepers. That device on the far left is about the size of a silver dollar in diameter. Uh, the range is blocks to miles, depending on which battery you put on. It's essentially the same circuit. It does not use GPS at all. This transmits a 200 megahertz beacon or whatever frequency you want to buy it in. It's attached with magnets to the underside of the vehicle or put into packages, and that's the handheld receiver that tells you where it is. This is a device that DHS has bought millions of dollars worth of these devices. They're an inch and a half by an inch by an inch. That's what the circuit board inside looks like. The circuit board is just under one inch by an inch and a half. Uh, battery powered, uh, simple nine, uh, three volt lithium battery will run it for about nine days. Hardwired into a vehicle, you have an infinite power supply. Uh, the stuff that's come out in the last few years, that is sitting on a quarter. This is a low jack module for those of you who have not hacked one yet. It operates at that frequency between 200 and 300 mega, uh, megawatts, milliwatts. <laughs> no. your, your, your car glows in the dark now. <laughs> they are not large at all. This is the newer model that they've been using that has the retrieve function on it. The old models were about that big. And if you didn't start your car once a month, you would come out to find you couldn't start your car because the LoJack module had sucked all the power out of your battery. Uh, this is a new unit. It's made by Motorola, not my LoJack. Uh, this is what the inside of one looks like. And this is a schematic, which they're very pissed that I have. This is what one looks like on a spectrum analyzer. If you see this on a spectrum analyzer, the car has a LoJack. Uh, the data it transmits is actually on the side bands, not on the primary carrier. So if you're listening for the carrier, you're not going to hear anything. It's double, it's double modulated as a covert, you know, covert measure, they call it. Uh, and it transmits when it's in hunt mode, it transmits every 16 seconds. Upper, this is oscilloscope traces, upper left-hand corner is a 16 second hunt mode, which means somebody's stolen this car, track it, track it, track it, and the state police are waiting for a beacon every 16 seconds or less. If it's in sleep mode, which means nobody has reported it stolen, it checks in once an hour. So if your car has low jack and you put a bug detector in it, once an hour it better be registering that low jack or it's broken. This is a problem because if you have low jack in your vehicle, the spy can use your low jack signal because it's 250 milliwatts. He can use that as a tracking beacon. They're not happy with me telling people this. Uh, one of the big problems with people bugging your vehicle is they invariably damage wires. They battery load, which means your car won't start. You can get bad bulbs. You get a, your, your headlight goes out. You keep replacing the bulb and it keeps going out. What's happening is the bug is drawing power down. The, the uh, ohms of the light are staying the same, but the current draw is changing. And what's happening is it's causing your bulb to burn out because somebody's installed a tracking device behind your headlight. You don't have to get into the vehicle to take a headlight out, put a tracking device on it, or a taillight. Taillights are real popular because you can access most taillights from the outside of the vehicle. You just take a couple of, of nuts out, pop the taillight out, hook it up. Those are hot all the time. When you hit the brake pedal, it just applies ground, so you got voltage there already. You can get vehicle fires, and people have actually had vehicle fires because somebody put a tracker in and didn't do it right, and they lost their car. Uh, Key indicators that something is afoot, you, your locks suddenly go bad. Usually not on the driver's side. It's usually the passenger side they suddenly go bad in. Uh, your alarm gets bypassed. I recommend checking your alarm once every two weeks to make sure it works. Go to every door, open the door, make sure the alarm goes off. Shopping malls are a good place to do this at. Um, <laughs> not at your house. If you find that all of a sudden one of the access doors doesn't work, you need to get it looked at right away. Uh, if you look underneath the vehicle and you find an area where it looks somebody took a putty knife and scraped grease off the undercarriage of your vehicle, they probably did because magnets don't stick to grease very well. So these are the kinds of things you need to look at. If you're in your vehicle and you find 
Velcro in odd places. <laughs> Why do I have Velcro underneath the passenger seat? Or in one case, I opened the customer's glove compartment because I suspected there was a bug inside, and on the back of the glove compartment were two Velcro strips. And I measured it, looked it up in my database, and I said, oh, there was a trim track in this, and it was a hardwired trim track. How do you know that? I can tell by the distance on the Velcro strips, because this is the distance of the Velcro strips that trim track gives their people. And I know it's hardwired because this right here is where they tied into your cigarette lighter. And here's the connector, and there's probably fingerprints on this. Give this to the attorney. He did, and it was his wife. Uh, also look for if you lose jewelry and you go hunting for it underneath your seat, you may find a bug. A lot of bugs have been found by people who lost money, jewelry, bottles. I had one a customer up in New Hampshire. They lost a baby bottle. It rolled underneath the seat, so they said, oh, they got home, they got in the garage, they got a flashlight out, they looked underneath there, they found an audio recorder. They were very upset. They would not have found it had they not looked under your seat. Look under your seats. It's not going to hurt anything. If you want somebody to do a sweep for you, uh, what we're referring to is a, a full examination of the vehicle. It takes 12 to 36 hours for even a simple vehicle. If it's a, a luxury Mercedes with all kinds of gadgets and gizmos, it might take two and a half, three days. Uh, they take a while. A cursory inspection run about four hours. If you're going to do it yourself, start on a Friday night. Don't plan to do anything at all on Saturday. And plan to go to the auto parts store on Sunday and buy stuff you broke. <laughs> uh, TSCM is an inspection by an engineer or a technician of a physical place, person, or item. It's a technically trained person. A significant piece of, amount of equipment is required if a person is doing it for pay. You do not need a lot of scientific test equipment to do some of these exams. You primarily need a flashlight and a manual from the factory that talks about where all the screws and nuts and bolts and stuff are. You don't want to take your dash apart and not be able to get it back together. Okay? Uh, illicit eavesdropping is a $6 million business. Uh, these numbers are old. Uh, this is probably 10-year-old numbers, but it was the last time the State Department would talk to me. Uh, it was $6 million of eavesdropping equipment was sold each day in the United States. Nowadays, a lot of that's sold over the internet, it's sold on eBay. The spies I have at eBay tell me that it's in the tens of millions of dollars per day. GPS trackers, audio devices, tape recorders, video cameras, spy cams. Uh, layperson, Defenses Against the Dark Arts. I'm almost finished here. I'll, I'll turn you guys loose and not torture you further. Things that you can do. Install a vehicle security system, a good vehicle security system, not some cheesy one from Best Buy, a good one from Best Buy. If it doesn't cost 400 bucks, it's not a good security system. A good security system is going to start about $400, exclusive of installation. The installation is probably another 100, 150 bucks, but you'll save it on the first year of insurance. Okay? If you consider, I'm not saying remove, I'm saying consider removing your OnStar. Consider minimizing your cell phone usage. That doesn't mean just your car either. If you want privacy, lay off the transmit button on your cell phone. Take the battery out of your cell phone so that you have to put the battery in your cell phone, consciously make an effort, not just reflexively reach in, flip it out, and start sending BlackBerry. Bad news. Minimize your Bluetooth usage. If you have Bluetooth, turn it off unless you're using it at that time. Buy a foil bag for your speed pass. If you're not going through the tolls, don't have your speed pass out. And if you're going through the tolls, maybe you don't want your speed pass out to be anyways. And get, you know, just cover up your license plate. Always lock your vehicles in an attached garage with locking doors. How many people don't have a locking door on their garage door? They have a garage door opener, but they don't have a locking door. They don't drive in, push the button, the door roll down and then go lock the garage door. My neighbors hate me because they know I'm the one who keeps opening all the garage doors at 3 o'clock in the morning in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and they've told the police that too. Their dog barks at 3 o'clock in the morning, so I make their garage doors open. <laughs> Yes, I have. <laughs>
if that dog barks for more than 15 seconds after 11 o'clock at night, all my neighbor's garage doors open them. <laughs> and, and, yes, and they'll call the police, and the police will come knock on my door. I'll go, no hable inglés, no hable inglés. <laughs> so they know it's me, but, you know, hey, life sucks. Always park in a well-lit area, especially at work. Uh, vehicles are very commonly hit at work. People have a false sense of security at work. If you're going through an acrimonious divorce, get handicap plates for your vehicle. <laughs> so you can park real close to the 100 feet away. Do not park next to a van. So if there's a handicap van in the handicap spot next to you, park between the van and the building, not on the other side of the van. And if somebody's going through uh, uh, divorce proceedings where there's, they've had some uh, uh, ugliness of physical violence as a safety measure, uh, we do recommend that they get a temporary handicap plate so that they can park real close to the building legally and they don't have to walk across the parking lot to minimize domestic abuse. One of those little security tips. Uh, watch for scuffed interiors. So if not your, where your butt sits, but the area over your head suddenly gets a smudge or a crease on it, and you didn't just get an oil change, you might want to check some stuff out because somebody may have pulled the headliner down so they could get their bugging device up in there. Watch for missing screws. I've actually had customers have me come out to check their vehicle because they had, their uh, Porsche Cayenne had five screws on the hinge that held the glove compartment cover in place. Today, it has three. They're missing two, and they didn't go to the garage. So I come out, I look at it, I say, yeah, you are missing two screws. Well, I need you to check it for bugs. Uh, oh, crap. OK, this is how much it's going to be. Open it up, check it out. Yep. Yep, there's a tracker. Here it is, right here. I'm not going to touch it. Call the police. Call your attorney. Two missing screws, OK? It's, it can be that simple. If you get in your vehicle and your seats don't fit your butt all of a sudden, somebody's been in your vehicle. It may have been a valet, but if you don't have valet parking at work, and all of a sudden it worked this morning, it doesn't work now, the spy may have moved your seat back so he could get up underneath your dash. Um, supervise your vehicle when it's in the shop. Never leave the vehicle in the parking lot and put your keys in the glove compartment, or in the drop box. If if you have to have your vehicle towed, have it towed to your house. And then the next day, have it towed to the shop. Don't ever leave it at the dealer shop. And tell the dealer that if you have to leave it there overnight, it has to be put inside the building. Okay? Faking a malfunction, like by clipping a brake line or a transmission line or screwing with the function of the vehicle, is a good way to put it in a dealer's lot for a few days so a spy can get at it for several days unsupervised. Because you're conscious and careful at your house, you're not conscious and careful at a vehicle at a shopping mall or at a dealership. And a dealership is a fixed place with poor security despite what the dealership tells you. Um, I keep talking about gloves and flashlights. $3 flashlight, 50 cents worth of latex gloves. Inspect every square centimeter outside Centimeters, not inches. Centimeters are smaller than inches. Okay. Every square centimeter on the outside. Pay special attention to the lights, the area around the lights, and everything under the vehicle. Uh, once you move into the vehicle, remove everything from the car that the car didn't originally come with. So the empty soda cans, or in my case, empty Guinness cans under the seat. <laughs> Remove those, remove the fuzzy dice, remove everything that didn't come with the vehicle. If you've got a little, you know, uh, blessed figure on the dash, take it out of the car, put it in a box, because you can't inspect around your tchotchkes, okay? Remove the boot, for those of you who are from England, the boot. In the United States, we call it the trunk. This is the part of the car that does not have the engine in it, okay? <laughs> So if you have an engine in back, the boot is in front, and vice versa. You want to take everything out of the boot, including the jack, the spare tire, all the 
uh, emergency systems, the jumper cables, everything you have in there, and then there's going to be a cardboard liner in there. Carefully, so as not to damage it, remove it. You would be amazed what you can find underneath that liner, because that liner is one of the A number one concealment places for bugging devices on vehicles. Most people's trunks are not on an alarm system. So when you have your alarm system installed, make sure that they put a hood switch in, make sure they put a trunk switch in. So if anybody screws with the trunk or the hood, it trips the alarm. Also make sure that if you have an alarm system installed that it sends you a page on your cell phone or sends you an email that, hey, somebody's screwing with such and such and not just beep, 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 beep on a remote control that's out of range. If I park 5,000 feet away, a really good car alarm isn't going to do crap for me, okay? Now when I go back to get in the vehicle and I go click, click, and it's going to go beep, boop, I don't know, crap. But I don't know at the time. So have it set up so that it fires off a wireless alarm. Make sure you're in range of the wireless alarm. Make sure it sends something to your cell phone. So, that, oh, my cell phone's ringing. Oh, it's my car telling me somebody's raping it. I can run out there and go deal with it and have it send you an email or hit you on something on your iPhone. Once you get in the boot of the car, you need to identify all the wires. If you don't recognize a wire or you see a connection that looks hanky, a good spy is not going to do a look on wire, but a PI, limited on time and money and resources, will trace it to where does it go. So there's this wire hooked up to this tail light, but not to this tail light, and it's a crimp on connection with black electrician's tape. Hmm. Trace it, trace it, trace it. Oh, it goes underneath the rear passenger seat. Pop the rear passenger seat out. That's the next step. Anytime you do a bug sweep, pop the rear passenger seat out. Most of them are in two pieces. You have the back of the seat and the bottom of the seat. You remove those, all of a sudden you have huge cavernous spaces in your vehicle. I would not recommend popping the seats out if they're heated seats, though, because most people screw the seats up when they do this. If you're a technically gifted person, take all of the seats out of the vehicle to do a bug sweep. When somebody brings a vehicle to our shop, we take all the seats out, we take the dash out. It scares the hell out of the customer when we do it, but we have yet to break a car. Uh, inspect the upholstery, inspect the consoles, the center consoles, the glove compartment, take the glove box out of the vehicle, get a flashlight, look up around, because remember the spy is looking for a quick install. So get a flashlight, look around, feel for where a spy would be putting it. Don't be, amazed, don't be surprised if you feel Velcro. Velcro is where the bug was and you were too stupid to get there quick enough and the spies removed his bug. If you feel Velcro, there's usually has been a bug there. If you feel black electrical tape on a wire, but it's been cut off, it means somebody has removed the bug. You did something to tip the spy off. And since most people are not in the profession of hunting spies, mm -hmm they make honest mistakes and tip their hand to the spy. If you're going to have a sweep done or you're going to do it yourself, you need this information right here to get the right book from your dealership. You need to know, well, if you're gonna have a bug sweep done, you need to tell me where the location is. You need the plate number. You need to give the dealer the VIN, make and model, trim code, the, like is it an LX, an LXR, an L, a limited, or what? The engine size, because the books sometimes are different from engine size to engine size. The color is frequently of value because cars get scratched when big bug sweeps are done and they need to bring along the touch-up paint. <laughs> so you kind of need to let somebody know what the color is because I'm not saying it happens often, but sometimes furniture gets scratched, so I always bring a tackle box with stuff I can fix the scratch on the client's desk with. It happens. The date manufactured is important because the owner's, the shop manual will vary by date. So you can have a 2009 model and there'll be three different shop books. And if it's a really high performance vehicle, you could have five different powertrain books and six different schematics. So you could end up with a stack of books that thick if you don't have all of this information. You need to have service records list of all your prior work because if it was in the shop two weeks ago and you find something and the battery only will last for three weeks and it still has juice on it, it probably got put in when it was in the shop. So you want to consider 
your, your service and be sure to keep your service records because if something untoward were to happen to your vehicle, this will give you an idea as to when it happened because you can go to the dealer, have your attorney get their maintenance records and they'll pull their computer dump because they do a core dump of your, of your, your uh, vehicle every time you bring it into them. And they can pull that core dump and go, there was nothing there, nothing here, nothing here. Oh my God, all of a sudden we've got huge amounts of, of uh, out, or, uh, out uh, tail lights on the passenger side. Well, that's when the problem happened, but they didn't do anything about it because they could still see it glowing, but the computer kept tripping. And they said, yes, that, that's fine. If you have Cirrus or XM, that's very important uh, because the Cirrus and the XM modules, some of the modules will throw off your bug detection efforts because some of them transmit a signal and that signal is perfectly harmless, but that signal can make you go, oh my God, that module in there is a tracking device. No, that's your Cirrus or your XM module. So consider this. If you have OnStar, you need to know what your, your access code for that is or cut it. If you have a LoJack, you need to have it checked once a year. You also need to be aware that LoJack does transmit. Uh, average, when I do a vehicle inspection, I average 324 pages of written notes. Not 324 pages of manual, 324 pages of written notes, spectral analysis, wiring charts, diagrams, and I usually bring about a 350 page thick notebook and I take two days to go through a vehicle and I run about 324 average pages. Okay, it's, it's, it's very labor intensive. Uh, this is the methodology for finding stuff in a vehicle. It just constantly goes on a circle. Okay? <laughs> shake and tickle is where we take the vehicle. Okay, we've done everything. We shake it, we tickle it, we jiggle the seats. We try to tickle the dragging to wake up. So we've just gone through the whole thing exhaustive. We found absolutely nothing. So we shake and tickle, and it refers to a series of maneuvers that we do to make the vehicle. So if something is really, really hidden well, and we haven't found it yet, we may find it when you do the shake and tickle. Now, I've barely, believe it or not, I've barely have touched on how vehicles can be bugged. Barely. I have ver barely touched on how bugs are found. There are many other methods. You've got to pay close attention to your details. If you pay attention to the details, you will find every bug. Period. People want to know what Bill Gates is doing. They want to know what Steve Jobs is doing. If he breaks wind twice on the same day, their stock, market, their stock price drops 50 cents. Okay, so little tidbits of information can be leveraged for huge amounts of money. If we know who Jeff Bezos is meeting with or where he's driving his car right now, we can leverage that to make a bloody fortune. That's what spies do. They take little tidbits, they put the little tidbits together, they get the big story, and once they get the big story, they leverage it somehow. They leverage it for blackmail, they leverage it for stock price. God forbid Steve Jobs were to die today, but if he did, the stock price would drop like a stone. Okay? Uh, you talked about getting a car alarm to look at the page or send a text to mm -hmm. email. Wouldn't that interfere if there was some type of do, to, do the teardown through a nope. No, you don't plug it. Okay. No electronic no electricity to it, it makes no signal. The data that your PC installed and the one that your airbag computer stored mm -hmm. that you crashed, who owns that data or who can legally get it from you? Uh depends on which country and the condition uh, and what mood the judge is in. In most cases, the insurance company, as a matter of course, because they insure it, will download that. It, and they can do it just as legally as they can take a photograph of it. At some accident scenes, a really sharp cop will plug in and download before the tow truck even hooks up to it. In some cases, a really astute EMT will plug in and download so that he knows how fast your car was going because he treats you differently if you were going 15 miles an hour as opposed to 70. So, and that's if the, now downloading it does not erase it. So the EMT will get it, then the cop will get it, the insurance company will get it, and then the district attorney will come and get it. <laughs> so technically you own the vehicle, but other people have interest in it. Yes? You have to ask an attorney. I'm an engineer, not an attorney. And secondly, I've got a 19-year-old German car. Good for you. How much of this stuff exists in something memorable? That old, I'd be more concerned with bumper beepers. Yeah. 
but it's very easy to throw a uh, cell phone in or a GPS system in. It can be added easily, but you really don't need to be overly concerned on a vehicle that old with a vehicle, uh, you know, the biggest problem you're going to have with it is getting parts. Which is true. Yeah. It's a good, solid vehicle. It'll last 20 years, 300,000 miles. Yes. Yes. I've actually been to schools for like Cummings to do forensic analysis on black boxes taken out of commercial vehicles, which is why you didn't see any Cummings slides up here because I didn't want to violate my non-disclosure agreement. But uh, oh yes, and and when you burn them out, the truck doesn't go. You you, you make it go poof. You ever have you blown an airbag in a car? Were you able to drive home? Okay. So there's a lot of stuff in here that you have like classified FBI and whatnot. Well, it was kind of more of a joke. The FBI actually classified this after 9-11. Before 9-11, it was not classified. So, so what motivated you to give this talk with all the, I mean, you're revealing a lot of sort of crazy type stuff. Not really. I'm not saying don't, but yeah, I'm just curious. <laughs> what motivated you to give this talk? Like, uh, I'm an engineer. So you just want to share the knowledge some of the knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge I'm not going to share because I'm not going to share stuff that's truly classified. Uh, like, you know, I'm not going to give you Obama's, uh, what's his cell phone number now? Nor am I going to give you the access password to Dick Cheney's pacemaker. So it's just, it's just knowledge sharing. It's knowledge sharing. And it's stuff that uh, you could take it, you could get into some mischief with it, but I'm not going to give you enough information to go blow somebody's car up, nor am I going to show you how to install one of these devices. So I'm not going to give you the information to commit a felony. I'm going to teach you how to defend against it, not how to commit one. Uh, most of the, uh, historically, most of the stuff the FBI has used for surveillance has been proven in court to be illegal. Very small amount of their stuff actually gets admitted into court because it was illegally obtained. They can still benefit off the information you're obtaining in court. So. They can still benefit off the information. It doesn't stop them from doing it. So, yes? Have you ever had to pay out? Not yet, <laughs> but they, they say, somebody told me that, uh, well, uh, I'm not going to go there, but <laughs> if, if you're in love, you might, you might consider suicide. If you're being divorced, you might consider homicide. <laughs> yes? Oh. Putting things in. Yes. They can lead you astray. Um, also, one of the things that one of my colleagues on the hard day is that, you know, like, you haven't swept. First day you get stuff, and you put it right back in after somebody uh, tells you your car is clean, you just reinstall it. What we do is we tell people to put everything in clear plastic trash bags and to organize it by what they found. Don't throw anything away. Take it and put it in a clear plastic trash bag. If you take all your beer cans, <clears throat> and put them in one bag. Take all your, your, your paper cups, your soft drink, come in, put it in a different bag. So organize your trash, but don't throw anything away. If you find used marital aids and stuff, put those in small plastic trash bags. I need to see it, I don't want to touch it. But. <laughs> Floor chimes. Floor chimes. I'll, I'll remember that. And, and uh, I was working on a truck that was uh, recently um, for a friend. He had bought it. It was a state plow truck. Yep. On BV and the next tells. I plugged the scanner in and couldn't get the check engine code. The guy was clever enough to put onto the junkyard, grab an OBD2 connector out of the yep. car, and, and there was a dead OBD2 line yep. under the dash, so the one that you would obviously plug in. So I'm sure he hacked his next tell. Well, what they do now is... You know, that, that's, that's anybody that knows what they're looking for won't be fooled by that. But if an EMT or a cop is doing a quick grab, yeah. if the OBD2 connector that's where it belongs isn't applied on the side of the road, they're not going to grab it. The insurance company won't apply it. Uh, amongst my other uh, things that I do, I'm also an EMT. So if I come up on a real ugly accident, I'm going to get my iPhone out, plug it into the guy's thing, and go, 
I can't share this with the police, but I now know how fast he was going, and I know for hell he didn't have a seatbelt on. I don't care what he tells me. This says he did not have a seatbelt on, and I can tell the doctor, but the doctor can't tell anybody else. Yes, all the way in back. Yes. Three. Three. The rule, we have what we call the rule of threes. And if you find a bug, assume there are two more. Because a smart spy will throw down a bug that's easy for you to find so that you find it and go, I found it. There's no problem. Then there's the second bug that you're really going to have to spend a lot of time hunting for to find. And then there's what we call the spies bug. One is called the fool's bug. One's called the spies bug. The spies bug it's been there for a long time. And this actually comes through the Cold War, because during the Cold War, we used to install three and five bugs at a time. And Soviets did the same thing to us. The Chinese did it to us. We did it to the French. The French did it. So everybody does this. No, no, there, there is no country on Earth that doesn't bug every other country on Earth. We are the best buddies with Canada. They are we're, we're kissing cousins. We bug their embassies. They bug our embassies. Okay. Now, neither of our governments will admit to it. They're all kissy, kissy, you know you know, date my daughter kind of stuff, but, <laughs> but we don't trust them any more than we trust Mexico or we trust Argentina or we trust, there's levels of trust. We don't trust Cuba, but we trust Canada a little bit, but we don't give them all of our secrets. We'll let Canada have some top secret information, but not all of it. Some of it is no foreign dissemination, which means we don't really trust anybody other than us. Canada does the same thing. There's a lot of secrets that they share with us. There's a lot of secrets they won't share with us. Same thing with England, same thing Australia. A lot of stuff England and Australia shares, they won't share with us. A lot of stuff England gives to Australia, Australia gives to us because England won't give it to us. Israel is one of our greatest allies. They're also one of our biggest eavesdroppers. Okay? Everybody, everybody in diplomacy bugs everybody else and nobody trusts anybody. Yes? No, usually not. No, I think we'll just invade them. <laughs> the only thing they have there of value are the casinos and the massage parlors and you know some some oceanfront property and you said earlier that they sabotage cars get into a shop. A dealership, yeah. Is it is that because like you know they sometimes have deals with the dealership? No, it's because they have access. Yes. And so, uh, well, it depends on how good of an attorney you have. Look, what, look at the OJ case. Piles of evidence, piles of money. Piles of money given to an attorney equals zero evidence. Okay? If you have a bad attorney, you can have no evidence and still go to prison for 30 years. So, unfortunately, in the United States, uh, the juries do run the courtrooms and the judges, the referee, and the law says the way it should be done. But if you grease an attorney with the appropriate amount of cash, he can defend you even if they've got you on video for six hours. He can claim that somebody disguised as you. So yes, no, I'm not an attorney. I know engineering. I know the law. I know engineering. So it's going to depend. As a rule, do not drop your vehicle off at the dealership. And if you leave it there overnight, demand that they put it inside and then go get in a cab and drive by to make sure it's inside. And if it's not inside, get your keys, call a tow truck, have it picked up, never do business with that dealership again. Okay? Anybody can call a dealer, give the dealer your VIN number of your, of your car, and walk away from the dealership with a set of keys. Because your keys are based on your VIN number. You can give me the VIN number of your car either by looking at the VIN strip of your car or your license plate number, and I go to the DMV, I get your VIN number, and I can go home and cut with a, a cutter punch, go, okay, you have a Ford uh, F-350 pickup truck, VIN number, blah, 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 you know, the 1Z, the, the F, okay. Then I looked at my code book, go, okay, it's a punch, a three, a five, a seven, and a two. Go up, open the car, I steal your truck. That's how the repo guys do it. How do you think the repo guys get, 
they, they punch. They literally, they look at the VIN number, they look at the code book, and it goes 73521, 35721. It's like your paper punch. And they just punch a key. You, go out, you look on your driveway, you're going to go, there's these little pieces of metal. Well, that's where they punch the key out based on the VIN number of your car. Well, if you're concerned about this, go to a locksmith, have him take the factory cores out of your door and put new locks in that don't match the VIN number. I can go, you know, somebody in here, they, they have like a $400,000 Porsche. I can get the VIN number of that, go over here, get a key made, go over here, get a key fob made from code books, and then go steal their car from work. And they will be pissed. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Or they got low jack? Fine. I just, do e I just listen to the car. If it pings once an hour, I know it has low jack, so I just jam the low jack. He's got a GPS tracker in it. 75 bucks for a GPS tra a jammer. You can get it from Taiwan, 75 bucks plus shipping and handling. And it will make that car invisible. It will become a stealth Porsche. <laughs> Well, there's no such thing. It's like saying Windows security, you know. Higher end dealerships where your car is safe in a garage and there's a gate that has to be open for it. Uh, half the time they leave the keys in the car because you can't get out without opening the gate. Yeah. So you're actually less secure in a secure environment if somebody can get into where the cars are kept. The ones that have chain link fence in a shaky neighborhood, at least the last guy on the service desk makes a walk around to see that they at least lock the doors most of the time. But yeah, there are a lot of high-end places where they have really secure, where nobody can steal a car, but they don't bother locking them. Yeah. I, mean, I know guys who they work in downtown Boston, or they work in Lexington, a classified lab in Lexington. They will drive to Alwife, <laughs> to Alwife T-Station, park at Alwife T-Station, okay? They have their vehicle checked periodically. Their employer actually pays for it. Well, it's at Alwife T-Station. They will then get on the shuttle bus to go to Lexington because they can't park where they work. They are forbidden to park a personally owned vehicle at their place of employment. The shuttle bus will go to public parking area. Al Wife is one of the more popular ones because you can hit Cambridge, you can hit the JFK school. I know guys who actually they work at MIT and they park at Al Wife and they take the red line in for security reasons or they'll park at the airport, take the blue line in, and they'll make two subway changes to go up to work. Because what they're doing is they don't want people, A, they don't want people to know where they work, their employer doesn't want to know, people to know who works there because it's a black facility. And there's a lot of black facilities in Boston that we don't talk about. Boston actually has more spooks per square foot than any other place in the country except Washington, D.C. and San Jose, California. San Jose has more spooks per square foot. Uh, the, the, the spook hierarchy is Washington, D.C., 60-mile radius. San Jose, 60-mile radius. Wa uh, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, 60-mile radius. What's the ratio of the row? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we've got at least three representatives of federal law enforcement agencies in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to stay. I think we have the room until morning. Uh, I can stay here and answer <laughs> questions. Uh, I can answer questions out in the hallway. I don't know if anybody's going to throw us out, but nobody seems to be throwing us out. So, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I actually know people who have had, because there was a surgical condition, for example, if somebody has had a mastectomy or a heart transplant, a liver transplant, or a thoracic surgery, their doctor will actually recommend that their airbag on their side of the vehicle be legally disabled, but the vehicle legally has to be tagged that the vehicle has had the airbag disabled or removed. Uh, personally, I drive motorcycle. I drive cheap car, pickup truck, expensive truck, or expensive car. I have airbags on everything except the motorcycle. 
I would prefer to put my face into an airbag than a steering wheel. I also wear my seatbelt all the time, too, because I have flipped vehicles, although I don't want you know, seatbelts on my motorcycle. I'm, I've laid motorcycles down. I don't want the motorcycle attached to me as I'm sliding <laughs> sideways down the gravel road. Uh, but yes, it can be disabled. If a mechanic does it, there are certain legal liabilities he has to abide by, but it can be legally done. A lot of police cars have them done because they don't ever carry a passenger, but the airbags would interfere with the, deplo with the airbag deployed. It would launch his laptop into his face. So they'll have their laptop, their first aid kit, their AED, their jump bag, and all their equipment here, but they don't ride with a partner. If their partner has to ride, he rides in the back with a dog. Okay, So what they'll do is they'll disable the airbag on the passenger side, but they'll keep it active everywhere else. They'll keep the curtain airbags live, the ones that are in the, uh, in the ceiling liner. Well, that's another thing when you guys are the vehicles for bugs, don't discharge the airbags. Okay? If you have side curtain airbags, don't go poking at what you think is a bug because it might not be a bug. You might poke at it with a sharp stick and hear a loud noise and wake up in the emergency room with that stick <laughs> impaled in your leg. Okay, because airbags have explosives in them. That's how they work. It's not much explosive, but it's enough to launch you up. Uh, when I went through bomb school, they actually put one underneath somebody's chair and touched it off, and it hurt him badly. So, yeah, you, you can have some fun with airbags, too. Big fun with airbags. You know, a lot of fun with remote garage door openers, too, if your neighbors are pissed at you. <laughs> My neighbors actually have a petition because of their garage doors. I said, it's the dog. The dog barks. Something on the dog's bark collar keeps triggering it. It's not, I don't know what you're talking about. So, so you, you, you open your garage door, too? Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, technically, you can technically do it quite easily. Legally, in the United States, you cannot. It's, it's jamming. It's actually, believe it or not, if you import or export a jammer, it is a controlled military munition. And I'll give you an example. Just prior to our invasion of Iraq, Saddam Hussein was spending tens of millions of dollars in cash by every GPS jammer on earth he could find that he could attach to a balloon. Because what they were doing is they were taking helium balloons, putting a nine volt battery on it, taking a little GPS jammer, attaching it to that, and floating up in the air around Baghdad because they knew they were going to guide our bombs in with GPS. And he was an idiot because the GPS lock was 150 miles away. It would do terminal telemetry when it was 150 miles out, so that's where he needs to be jamming, not right over Baghdad. So a smart, smart thing would have been you know, for him to handle that matter a little differently. But you can actually jam GPS quite effectively, too, for about 50 bucks. If you're clever with a soldering iron, which half the people in here are, so I know that, uh, you can actually build a GPS jammer for about eight bucks. You can build a cell phone jammer for about $10 more. Your cell phone's not going to work, though, and you're going to piss off the guy next to you, and your next-door neighbor's not going to be able to use his cell phone, and after suddenly getting this black hole of cell phone coverage 300 feet in radius around your house, Sprint's going to come out and go, ooh, somebody's jamming the cell phone. They're going to call the FCC, and the FCC's going to go, we have a warrant, and it's about a $15,000 fine for every day it's been used. So if you... Yeah. <laughs> 250, 256 bit, most of them are 303 megahertz. Some of them are 418 megs, some are 300. So if you hit like eight frequencies, roll it with 256 bits, everybody's garage door opens up. Why, why, not, just, why not just get the, uh, the dog collar? It's easier to shoot the dog. <laughs> but I, I like poetic justice. Okay, the dog wants to bark, keep me awake. Fine, 15 minutes, the garage doors open up. Five minutes later, the police show up knocking on my door. What the hell are you doing? I don't know what you're talking about. Are, are, most, of the, uh, are most of the bugs, uh, uh, or I should say, the, the bugs I'm assuming will mostly be prepaid GSM? 
Most, no, no. Most of them are prepaid CDMA. It got a better coverage in the United States. And most of the bugging is done via CDMA first, then GSM. Uh, mainly because CDMA is wicked cheap. Qualcomm owns GSM, essentially. Most of the engines for uh, the, the, little, uh, the little modems that they make are all Qualcomm boxes. Uh, and units have actually been traced back to the original buyer by the device being found, taking a batch code and a serial number, going to Qualcomm and subpoenaing Qualcomm, who says, well, we sold 50 of those to this company. And then they subpoena the records from that company. And they go, well, we made those for the FBI. And the FBI goes, oh, crap. That was the Forest Service. The Forest Service Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we give those to the post office. Yeah. Yes. I love, I love defibrillators. I got a whole selection of various defibrillators that are made, and I've gotten all kinds of stuff I've written about hacking defibrillators remotely. I was thinking more of an implant. Like my wife has a pacemaker. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah, like a Medtronics. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of them. I can actually program them from about a meter away. You get me, uh, if I can make contact with you, I mean, actually take a magnet and put it on the defib, I can reset it and make your heart rate drop down to 60 beats per minute. And with the remote control system, I'm from about, yeah, a good couple of meters, actually. I can actually make your pacemaker go up and down and up and down and high and low. I can't make it go below 60 beats per minute, but I can make it do all kinds of clever things. It would be unethical for me to do that because that would be... But I've actually rigged them up to oscilloscopes, to oscilloscopes, and some of my neighbors know that I'm kind of like a Frankenstein. And <laughs> the guy who owns the dog, he has a defibrillator. <laughs> and he's heard rumors from my other neighbors that I have a whole bunch of defibrillators set up, and I have a Medtronic's <laughs> defibrillator, <laughs> implanted defibrillator, it's called an, inner, uh, in, uh, uh, an implanted cardiac defibrillator a little hump that goes on under, uh, just under the shoulder, and he's terrified to turn his defib off one of these days. <laughs> or his pacemaker, actually, is what he has. He's terrified I'm going to turn it off. I'm not going to turn it off. He knows that. Police know that. It's funny as hell. <laughs> no. I, uh, on a workbench, I will. But I won't. Well, what it, it's referred to as a it's not so much the pacemakers aren't really painful. The defibrillators actually stop your heart because they throw a couple of joules across your heart, and they hurt. In fact, in the hospital, they like to medicate the patient before they cardioconvert the patient. Because if you throw 50 joules through somebody's chest, they're going to come up off that table painfully. And if you throw 300 joules through somebody, they're going to come clean up off that table. Uh, it's not quite the way it happens in the movies, but I've seen hundreds of people just defibbed in the, in the hospital where they just run, you know, uh, actually this way, they run a couple hundred joules through the chest, and that person comes up like they just got saved. If it's not attached appropriately. The reason those defib pads are so big is to spread the contact area out so it doesn't burn the skin. If they do it through a small pad, it will leave a blister. I have, I have successfully tracked them back to the person who bought it, who paid for it, the PI who installed it, the person he was working for, and it's really helpful when they leave their American Express receipts in their desk drawer. And the box that it came in from the spy shop is still in the trash, okay? And the telephone records show 15 calls to eight different spy shops to buy one. And when the wife moved out, she left all that in the husband's house. And he goes, I don't know what's happening. And I said, where's the trash? Well, this just happened. Where's the, have you taken the trash out yet? No. Go through the trash. Here's the Amex receipts. And here's the label from the UPS box. And here's the charge slips. And here's the phone records. Frequently, I can track back as to exactly who did it. Uh, in the case of a cell phone, I own them. Because somebody's got to pay that cell phone bill. 
even if it's a prepaid cell phone, they had to activate that cell phone somehow. And most people call from their office or from a phone that can be tracked back to them when they activate their prepaid phones. A smart man, and this is part of the classes that I teach to reporters, is tradecraft how not to burn your source. What you do is you go to a place that's at least 30 miles away from where you work, you live, or you normally drive. So if you normally live in Washington, D.C., and you work at a major newspaper in downtown Washington, D.C., you go to Richmond, Virginia, where you don't have any family, no kin, no connections. You go into Walmart, you buy three prepaid telephones. Then you go to Best Buy, you buy three prepaid telephones. You spend the whole day going to all these different places. You never buy more than three. Okay, you go to the truck stops, you buy two or three. Then you go to a hotel where you can sit down at a payphone without checking in, and you spend the next six hours activating all of those from the hotel telephone. Then you take the battery out of the phone, and you write what the phone number is on it, and all of them are going to be Washington, D.C. area codes, okay, because you're setting up for the Washington, D.C. area code, and then you provide these to your sources, so you keep one, and your source keeps one, and your source does something to tell you you need to turn your phone on, okay? And then he, he will put the battery in your phone. He'll put the battery in his phone. You'll both do that at a distance of 30 miles away from where you actually live, work, or go to church. And then the two phones talk to each other. But you never call a landline with a, throw down, a throwaway phone. And you never call from work or to work or anywhere within the cell phone coverage of that. In Washington, D.C., you usually run about a mile and a half to two mile cell phone coverage. So I can tell you that you're calling from Tyson's Corner at a 270 degree arc from the cell phone tower at Tyson's Corner. So not only do I know that where you are within a two mile radius, but I know the direction you are. I know if you're moving or traveling or not. Are you at a fixed location? Now this is of great value to somebody who's trying to find a spy. If this guy is a spy and you're a reporter, like this guy's Deep Throat and this guy's Bob Woodard, okay, Whoever's trying to figure out who the leaker is is going to look at who the reporter is. So they'll look at all the reporter incoming records, the reporter's cell phone bills, the wife's cell phone bills, their grandmother's cell phone bills, the bills of the daughter, who's calling in, and then they'll try to make a connection. Now, they're not supposed to be doing that legally, but so their job is to catch the guy who's doing the leaking, not necessarily obey the law. And FBI agents get all pissed off at me when I say stuff like that, but hey, their reputation speaks for themselves. Do you have an investigator's license? No, don't need one. You need one in North Carolina, Nevada, and uh, West, uh, uh, Washington State. I'd like to see them make, make everybody get one, but then I'd also like to see them make everybody be confident in bug sweeps which nobody will do because all of a sudden everybody who does bug sweeps won't be able to do any bug sweeps anymore because they can't demonstrate technical competency nor equipment access. So North Carolina requires a one-week class on bug sweeps. That's it. Um, uh, Nevada and Washington State require nothing other than uh, you used to know somebody who used to drive a police car. And I know people in North Carolina who are convicted felons who got a license. And I also know people in North Carolina who got their dog licensed to do bug sweeps, just to prove what a sham it was. So, anything over here? Yes. Our has been discussing the possibility of GPS to Yes. It typically, it's typically going to be the same thing. Uh, some of these, the, some of the uh, high occupancy, uh, high occupancy, high uh, usage road taxes, like what they have in England. I drive to London and I go through London during rush hour. I'm going to pay a tax, and you, they call. They want you to call from your cell phone, and they bill. They can bill your phone and give your credit card number. They can bill it like that. Some areas, like uh, New York, Manhattan, is trying to do this right now, but they're not sure exactly how they're going to do this. What's that? Yeah, they're, they're not, 
they have a huge difficulty trying to figure out how they're going to do it because if they use a GPS tracking device, I can feed the GPS tracking device bogus information. You can get one of these Qualcomm modems, clone the modem that's in the tracking device, and feed it bogus data. And one of the things that we do with it, we, I love doing this with the trim tracks. I can feed a trim track bogus data and make the, the user, the, the person who's exploiting the bug, think that I'm in San Francisco when I'm actually parked in front of his house. So, well, yeah, he hasn't, he's been in Washington, D.C. for the last three weeks. Have you looked outside his office? No? Why? Well, he hasn't. So, uh, the big problem with using wireless devices is that they're really easy to screw with, and the cheaper they are, the easier they are to screw with. It's like uh, I showed you on a trim track. Backdoor password is zero, 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 zero. And when people change it, they usually change it to the word password, zero, 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 because you have to have eight letters. So, unfortunately, uh, uh, every time they come out with a new piece of surveillance gear, we love it because it gives us intellectual stimulation for about two weeks. And then we go, okay, let's, you know, they'll come out. Well, we got this new spread spectrum, can't be broken, can't be hacked, it's unpenetrable, cipher encrypted. Give me one for about a week. You can't, you say you can't find it? You want to bet? Because if one man can invent it, one man, and if one man can, can, can build a lock, one man can pick a lock. It takes a long time to pick that lock. But he'll figure out a way to pick like your, your, all your medicos. It, it, you know, impenetrable locks, or so they say. Well, m there are picks that you can buy for the medical biaxial locks. The medical M3s you can bump real easy, actually. In fact, medical went way out of their way to do a whole marketing campaign to show how bump-proof they were after they got out at, at I think, DEF CON a couple years ago. Medico absolutely flipped out. I got reams of material from Medico the day of DEF CON, because I'm also a locksmith, uh, reams of data. I got stuff FedEx to me from Medico that I didn't ask for, CD-ROMs and videos debunking the whole thing of DEF CON, because they were so embarrassed by it. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, I mean, it wasn't the first time. It, what it is is everything has a vulnerability and everything has a weakness. In the security profession, we have to recognize that everything has a vulnerability and a weakness, and we have to find it, close that breach, and move on. It's not, we're not there to exploit the breach. We're there to find the breach, close it up, shut it down, and move on. You know, people go, well, Windows isn't secure. And I said, well, neither is Linux, neither is Mac OS. There's really no really secure OS, you know, really. Any of your Macs, your PCs, any of that stuff can be hacked easily. But you can, what you can do is you find something, you close it up, you patch it, and you move on. You close it up, you patch it, and you move on. Half the people in here probably have iPhones. There's all kinds of really cute things you can do to an iPhone, real cute things you can do to an iPhone without actually touching the iPhone. Well, close, you find the problem, close it up, seal the breach, patch it, move on. And it just, it's, it's, the, it's just a constant circle that feeds on itself. You just, everybody in security has to do the same thing. You know, Walmart will always have trouble with shoplifters. Security people in this business will always have trouble with hacking and people exceeding access privileges and stealing laptops and breaking into it's 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 a perpetual it's a perpetual dance that we do i will constantly be looking for new and emerging bugging stuff because my job isn't to do the bugging my job is to stop it and that's what i focus on i'm not going to tell you how to go bug somebody's car i'm going to tell you how to find it how to stop it how to protect yourself against it and we all have our area of expertise and mine is tsm and bug sweeps are there any other questions? Good. I'm sure I ran over. Yes, I ran way over my time.
Thank you.